Well, good morning, church. Happy New Year to all of you. Let's start it off right by giving God the greatest praise we have. Sing it out with us with this heart. With this heart, open wide from the depths, from the highs, I will bring a sacrifice with these hands and with my hands lifted high. Lord, hear my song, hear my cry. I will bring a sacrifice. I'll bring, I will bring a sacrifice.
lifted up again him to the one who's rescued our soul to the one who has rescued my soul to the one who has welcomed me home to the one who is savior of all i sing a better word than all the empty claims that I've heard upon this earth speaks righteousness for me and it stands in my defense Jesus it's your blood and what can wash away our sins what can Tells of the Father's heart to make a way for us. All now holy we approach, not earthly confidence, it's only by your blood. Oh, and what can wash away? You may be seated this morning. Thank you so much for raising your voices with us. Father, we have gathered here today in your name and for your purposes. Lord, we thank you for the last year, the blessings of it, the challenges of it, that your grace and mercy were seen all the way through it. But Lord, we ask today as we open our hearts and minds up to hear from your word. Lord, we are, we are going to go after some golden calves this year, things that are in the way of you blessing us. And we, Lord, want to get rid of anything that is an impediment to you supernaturally touching our lives in this church. We pray for complete 
for guidance, for Holy Spirit anointing on our lives. And Lord, use this message to change lives, to better us. In Jesus' name we pray. If you pray with me, church, say amen today. In Scripture, there's over 500 verses on prayer because we need to pray. We need prayer teaches us to rely on God. Amen? There's over 500 verses on faith because without faith, we can't please God. And so the Bible teaches us how to pray. It teaches us how to trust God. But there's over 2,000 verses that deal with our money and possessions. Now, let me get this straight. 500 verses on prayer, 500 verses on faith, 2,000 verses on our money and possessions. Why so much more on those things? It's simply because of this. As you look at someone's money and possessions, as we look at our own, it is really a thermostat for life. It shows us what we believe. It shows us what's important to us. It shows us what we value. And it really shows us where God is on the list because it's a thermometer. That's why the Bible talks about it. So we're going to begin the year right in talking about priority items, about living a blessed life. Because I think a lot of, let's be honest, a lot of Christians live a life that you could live Anybody could live that, don't even, that doesn't even have a knowledge of God. Think about this. Can someone live your life the way you're living right now without even knowing God? If that's true, then we're not living a blessed life. By blessed, I mean God doing supernatural things on our behalf. Things that exceed explanation. That's the kind of life I want to live in 2017. I want to see God do supernatural, unexplainable things, except that the reason it brings him glory is that it's all God. He's the only explanation. That sounds exciting, doesn't it? Well, in order to experience that in our life, we have to put first things first. So let's look at some verses that God gave the children of Israel Because the children of Israel, before God called Abraham, Abraham was what? He was just a run-of-the-mill guy. He was a polytheist. He actually believed in many gods. He was a, a pagan. And the thing that made Abraham different was God calling him in his life and Abraham responding in faith. And so his offspring, his kids... As we see when God brought children of Israel into the promised land that he had promised them for hundreds of years, they very quickly became like the surrounding nations because they forgot the thing that made them different was their relationship with God. That's what makes us different than people in the world, the fact that we have a real relationship with God. So it should show and how we live our life. So God said, this is what I want you to do to his kids so the people around you know that you worship the one true God and that they can see evidence of me in your midst. And here's some of the things he told his kids to make sure that they were different than the world around them. In Deuteronomy chapter 15, as God is explaining how they were to be different and The whole book of Deuteronomy and Leviticus is all an explanation of how God wanted them to be different. This is just a few things. It says, give to him, Deuteronomy 15, 10, and don't have a stingy heart when you give. And because of this, the Lord your God will bless you in all of your work and in everything you do. The world in general has a stingy heart. That is natural. That's natural. You don't have to teach your children to be stingy. We don't have to teach our kids to be selfish. They don't catch selfishness from the environment. We're born selfish, aren't we? I mean, we, 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 it, we come by it naturally. Okay? We're born, me first, everybody else, well, it doesn't really matter where you're at as long as I'm first. You see this every time there's road construction, you have to merge lanes. Everybody's saying, you go first, right? No, 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 no. 
Everybody's going in the lane that they say is disappearing, and they're driving by you that are, you know, waiting in the lane, and they're driving by, and you can hear them. They're going, suckers! As they t- and so finally, what do you do? Well, if you have a semi, you go over into that lane. But if you value your car, you don't, because in Michigan, they'll just run you over. Now, it, it proves that we're, we're selfish at the core. Everybody is. Everybody is. And Jesus said, this is who you are naturally to his kids. He said, so I want you to show the world that we're different by not having a selfish, stingy heart, by having a generous heart. Chapter 28, Deuteronomy, same book, verse 8, the Lord will grant you a blessing on your storehouses, And on everything you do, he will bless you in the land the Lord your God is giving you. Verse 12 says, the Lord will open for you his abundant storehouse, the sky, to give your land rain in its season, to bless all the work of your hands. You will lend to many nations, but you will not borrow. So he's very clearly, God's desire is to bless his children. To bless them. Well, what does bless mean? Being blessed means this. Look at your introduction. Being blessed means having the supernatural power of God working for you. Having the supernatural power of God working for you. Here's what this means by illustration. Days upon days filled with divine coincidences and heavenly meaning. Instead of days filled with same old, same old. Days filled with heavenly coincidences, things that only heaven could orchestrate. Right? I was driving around this week. I I was spending some time with my wife, and we were driving in her vehicle. And I don't normally drive that. I drive my vehicle, and I was driving hers, and we were on, had found ourselves on an expressway, and it was driving, and it was making this, when we got up to speeds that you drive, <laughs> okay, 70 plus, it was making this noise like it was going to fall apart. And so, being the good mechanic I am, you drive faster to make the noise go away. Isn't that right, guys? <laughs> Let's drive faster to make the noise disappear. Some of you ladies do that, too? Okay. Okay, that's, that's my mechanical knowledge right there. I am not a mechanic. And so you could hear it. It was like humming. And she was leaning down in the middle of the car. She was like, you can hear it. It's like right under there. And I was like, yeah. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, literally, because I'm not a mechanic guy, okay, I take it to the mechanic guy. Okay, I said, I wonder if we've picked up a piece of plastic or something, and it's, where did that come from? Where did that come from? I said it. My wife is a witness. I I really did. I said that. I don't remember driving over a piece of plastic, anything like that. And I, I pulled the car over, got down on my hands and knees and looked, and there was some shreds of plastic hanging up underneath my car. And so I crawled underneath the car. Now I'm a mechanic. I I got, you know, I crawled underneath the car, and it was so close to the ground, I couldn't get under there. So I drove over to a curb and got two of the wheels up on a curb to create more clearance. I crawled under there, and a plastic bag of some sort had gotten caught in a support for our drive shaft that goes to the back wheels. And it was wrapped right in there. And I started pulling that plastic bag. It was wrapped in there so tightly, it was making it not work right. And I kept undoing this. It had been in there. I mean, it was way in there. And I got those pieces out, got those pieces out, got on the car, and drove no sound. Yeah. Mechanic patch right there. Mechanic patch. Okay, I'm great with plastic bags. There it is. How in the world and where did that thought come from? 
That thought came from heaven. I am not smart enough. And anyways, it's uh, smart. Why plastic? How about a stick? How about an animal? How about something like that? But no, a piece of plastic out of nowhere, right into my brain, right into my brain. Where is that from? That's being blessed. That's what that is. It's a, it was a blessing from God. Now, some of you are sitting here saying, if you were blessed by God, you wouldn't have hit that plastic in the first place. Okay, stop being cynical. Okay, divine occurrences, divine coincidences, heavenly meanings. So we're going to look at some principles in Scripture. And we're going we're to talk about giving. And after this sermon, I'll see some of you in February when we're done with this series. Because you'll probably not want to hear anymore. You'll say, oh, no, no. And, and people avoid this. And yet, God very clearly told his kids, I want you, this is how you are going to be blessed. Right. Man, I want you and me and this church to experience God's blessing this year. And so the first principle we need to look at, because it's right in Scripture, is the principle of the firstborn. This is right in Scripture, the principle of the firstborn, because firstborn, first fruits, and tithe are all the same principle. We don't look at it like that, though. We think, oh, it's just the church after our money. Well, so God starts. Before he ever talks to Israel about their money, he first talks about their firstborn males. The firstborn males. Listen to this principle established by the Lord to Israel in Exodus, the 13th chapter. He said, consecrate, that means set apart every firstborn male to me. The firstborn from every womb, among the Israelites, both man and domestic animal, look at what God says, it is mine. That's what the Lord told his kids. He said, the firstborn of your children and the firstborn male of your children, firstborn male of your animals, it belongs to me. Well, why, why does God get to make those rules? Because he's God. And there's a bigger picture that he wants Israel to see. God didn't need his children. He didn't need their animals. He's trying to teach them what makes them special. That's what he's after. The whole thing is not about the animals. It's not about the kids. It's not about the tithe. It's about what makes us redeemable. Okay? Now, he says, he goes on in verses 12 and 13, the same chapter of Exodus, and he says, you are to present to the Lord every firstborn male of the womb, all firstborn offspring of the livestock you own that, that are males will be the Lord's. You must redeem, purchase back from the Lord every firstborn of a donkey with a flock animal, but if you do not redeem it, you have to break its neck. However, you must redeem every firstborn among your sons. Now let me summarize this, because for some of you, you've never noticed this, you've never read it. For others, it might be, oh yeah, I forgot that was there. The clean firstborn male was sacrificed of your flock, but the unclean animal or male child had to be purchased back from the Lord, because they were not allowed to sacrifice unclean animals that did not fit the description of clean animals. And so they had to replace, if you had a donkey, you would have to replace that donkey, which was considered an unclean animal, with a clean one. And likewise, their children were not considered acceptable sacrifices. They were unclean. They were sinners. They were born in sin, David said. And so it was an unacceptable sacrifice. So God said, when you have a firstborn male son, you have to redeem him, purchase him back from the Lord with the sacrifice of a clean animal. Interesting. Interesting. Because God is building into their whole thinking system the whole story of redemption. You see, Jesus Christ, the firstborn of God, God's one and only Son, was God's tithe 
to humanity. Say, what do you mean it was God's tithes? Look at what it says in John 1, 20, 1, 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Here is the Lamb of God, the clean one, who takes away the sin of the unclean ones. Since we could not sacrifice and give ourselves for our redemption, we had to be purchased by a firstborn that was clean. And there's only one human being ever born clean, and his name was Jesus Christ. He was God's tithe to humanity to redeem us. And it was built into the whole thinking system of Israel. Every time the womb opened on one of their animals, they were to think about redemption. Every time they were blessed with the first male child, they were to think of redemption because why? It did not belong to them. It belonged to the Lord. He built that into their thinking. Now, there's a lot of people that are Christians and they're grateful for what God and they say, but you know, I'm, I'm just not in a position to be generous and to give because I will give when God blesses me. Well, notice that Jesus was given before anybody believed. He didn't say, you know, God didn't say, you know, when everybody believes I'm God, then I'm going to give my son. No, he gave his son while we were sinners and we were enemies to him. He gave him. It says in Romans 5, 8, but God proves his own love for us in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 8, 29, for those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers. Now, this is illustrated for us in Egypt. This is where we see this principle come to light. Going back to Exodus, the 12th chapter, God sent, and we're going to get to this in the third message, but God sent how many plagues to Egypt? Ten. How many days was Daniel tested in his eating? Ten. How many commands were given to us? Ten. What does God want us to give? A tenth. The, letter, the number 10 is the number of testing. The 10 commandments were to test our hearts. The 10 days were to test God's ways against the king's ways in Babylon. The tithe is also a test of our heart. It's a revealer of our heart. And so in Egypt, the 10th plague, because a lot of times we read the Bible and we since we don't know the principles of it, we read and say, man, why did God get to just show up and say, hey, I'm going to kill all the firstborn males of every man and beast? Well, now you understand why. Because they already belong to him. And Egypt and Israel refused to give it to him. Israel weren't giving their firstborn. They were not circumcising their kids. They were not obeying the law. And they weren't offering up Sacrifice the Lord. So he shows up to deliver them. And he says, here's what I want you to do. I'm sending the death angel through. And I want you to take a lamb from your flock, firstborn male, and sacrifice it. And I want you to take the blood from that lamb, and I want you to paint it on the doorpost and across the lintel. Of your house. Look at what I'm doing. The doorposts and the lintel. And that's the sign of what? The cross. Amen. He could have said, paint it on the wall. Paint the wall outside your house. Paint around your windows. But he said, no, paint it on the doorpost. Make it a cross. Amen. That's what it's all about. And in Exodus 12, 7, it says, They must take some of the blood, put it on the two doorposts, and the lintel of the house where they will eat that sacrifice. And it says that the, death, that the Lord sent the death angel through that night, and the firstborn that were in houses that had been redeemed by the sacrifice, they were safe. Amen. But the ones that weren't, the Lord took what belonged to him. He just took what was his. 
just took what was his. See, by tithing, we are trusting God to take care of the rest. That's all it is. Hey, tithing is about us. It's not about God. It's about me learning to trust God, giving him first so that he could redeem the rest. In Matthew 16, 25, it says, for whoever wants to save his life, keep it for myself, they lose it. But whoever loses life, gives it away, because of me will find it. It's like church. Why why don't we meet in the middle of the week? Or why don't we meet on the Sabbath, which is the last day of the week? No, we meet on the first day of the week. Why? Because we give God the first day, and we're asking him to bless the rest. That's what we're doing. We're giving him the first, saying bless the rest. So there's the principle of firstborn. This is the same mindset as the principle, second thing, of the first fruits. First fruits. Now, where was this established? Once again, in Exodus, as the Lord's preparing Israel to go into the land, and he wants them to be separate from all the other nations. He says in Exodus 23, verse 19, he says, Bring the best of the first fruits of your land to the house of the Lord your God. Notice two words there. The first of your fruits, and where you bring it? To the house of the Lord. I love missions. He doesn't say take your first fruits and give it to missions. I love parachurch organizations. But he doesn't say give your first fruits to parachurch. He says bring it to the Lord's house. And that day it was a tabernacle. And this day it's called the church. The local called out body of believers. He said bring the first of your fruits. Notice he didn't say after you get your harvest in and make sure you have enough, give me a tenth. No, he wanted the first First, of, that the crop yielded. It would be so hard to do that, right? Why? Because why? You're giving it to him first and believing that he will bless the rest. Amen. Amen. Notice this is teaching us something. To put God first. And me second. Hmm. In Proverbs 3, 9, and 10, Solomon writes, Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first produce of your entire harvest, then your barns will be completely filled and your vats will overflow with new wine. He said, give God the first. If I laid $10 bills out before you as an example today, which one of those $1 bills would be the tithe? You'd say, they're all the same. No, the tenth is the first one you spend. The tithe is the first one you spend. So if you buy a newspaper, that's your tithe. You took your tithe money, you bought a newspaper with it. Or if you buy a cup of coffee, well, you're going to have to add a couple dollars, but that's your, that's, that's your tithe money. He wants it to be the first spent. The first. He wants that. We see this illustrated when the children of Israel entered into the land And the first city they encountered was, of course, in the central part of the promised land. It was the city of Jericho. Remember what God told them? He said, I'm going to give the city. All they had to do was march around it once a day. And then on the seventh day, they marched around it seven times. He said, at the moment, shout, and the place fell down. Rahab and her family were the only ones that made it out alive. But remember what he told them? Don't take any of the stuff from Jericho. Give it to my treasury Give it to my treasury. God gave him a great victory. And he said, but I want you to take all the spoils of this victory and put it in the treasure house. Now, it's it's because God was getting greedy and because he didn't want to meet their needs. No, he said, put me first. And what did he do? They had 39 victories. He gave them all the rest of it. He just wanted them to put him first. Trust me first. And they were 39 and 0. All those victories. Okay? Except for that second one. When they went to Ai. Because, see, one guy, Achan, one guy said, well, I'm just going to take a little stuff and put it under his tent. And how did they know that he had taken a little stuff? Because when they went to Ai, they lost. And people died. Because God's blessings weren't 
on them because they had disobeyed. I wonder how many blessings we're missing Amen, brother. because we won't simply obey the principle of firstborn, first fruits, and the tithes. I wonder what we're missing. Jericho, it says, for all the gold and silver and the articles of bronze and iron are dedicated to the Lord and must go into the Lord's treasury. Verse 18, though, says, but keep yourselves from the things set apart that belong to him, or you will be set apart for destruction. If you take any of those things, you will set apart the camp of Israel for destruction and bring disaster on it. That's exactly what Achan did. And over 30 families lost their breadwinner, lost their, the man of the home because of Achan's selfishness. Because why? His selfishness destroys the picture of redemption. It destroys the picture of redemption. And so the Old Testament closes with Malachi, the prophet, telling Israel and challenging them about robbing God. In Malachi 3, 8, and 9, it says, Will a man rob God? Yet you're robbing me. You ask, well, how do we rob you, God? And he says, by not making the payments of the tenth and the contributions. And so you're suffering under a curse. Yet you, the whole nation, you're still robbing me. Now, you're sitting here today, and maybe you're a real student of Scripture, and you're saying, you know what, that tithe thing, it's Old Testament. It's Old Testament. Yeah, and adultery is an Old Testament thing, too. So I guess, I guess we're, it's just free to you know, sleep with whoever now. And murder is an Old Testament thing. So are we free to murder now? That loving God with all your heart, mind, and soul, that's an Old Testament thing, too. When Jesus said, what should I do? He said, you should love God with all your heart, mind, and soul. So he quoted the first command. And he said, and the second one's like unto it. Love your brother as yourself. So clearly, Jesus didn't say, hey, man, now that I came, you can just ignore that. He didn't say that. Nowhere did Jesus say, just ignore that stuff. Jesus said, no, I came to fulfill the law. God's firstborn, given to redeem the unclean. So why would I want to take that example and expunge it from my life when it's the most beautiful example of what God did when he saved us? Giving him the first to redeem the rest. Notice what it says in Malachi 3.6. Because I, Yahweh, have not changed. So it was true for them. It's true for us. He says, I don't change. So there is many things under the law that are still life principles with God. I mentioned some of them. Adultery. Murder. They're still life principles. Only in the New Testament, they get highlighted. See, in the Old Testament, it says, don't kill your neighbor. In the New Testament, it says, don't hate your neighbor. Because if you hate them, it's like murder in your heart. It's even, it's heightened. It's not lowered. It's heightened by grace. Grace is superior to the law. Amen? Okay. Now, let's think about the two first brothers, Cain and Abel. Because it tells us right in Genesis 4, and this is before Moses got the law. This is before the Ten Commandments, before everything. Yet we see them bringing the first fruits and the firstborn offerings to the Lord. It's before it all. It's in the garden. It's in the fourth chapter, for crying out loud. Look in the fourth chapter. It says, in the course of time, now that's interesting, course of time, Cain presented, underline this word, some of the land's produce as an offering to the Lord. But church, what produce did God want? First. Cain gave him what? Somewhere down the line. Cain was like, I'm going to make sure I get mine, and then I'm going to give God some. And notice it was down the line. It wasn't early. It wasn't the first part of the harvest. It was in the process of the harvest. He brought an offering. To the Lord. And Abel, his brother, also presented an offering, key word, some of the firstborn of his flock and their fat portions. Abel followed the picture of redemption. 
Cain did not. Abel gave God his first. Cain gave him somewhere in the middle. Hmm. Because there's a lot of people like, oh, man, I don't, what's the big deal? I give. God wants our first. Because it, it teaches us by principle to put ourselves behind. So the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but he did not have regard for Cain and his offering. Cain was furious and looked despondent, and we know what happened here. Cain revealed what was really in his heart, why he refused to give God his first, because he was so self-focused. He thought the answer to this was slaying his brother in cold blood. That's where selfishness leads. It doesn't lead to generosity. It leads to disaster. It leads to curse. Cain was cursed because of this. See, the tithe was established by God to redeem all the rest. Leviticus 27, 30 says, Every tenth of the land's produce, grain from the soil, or fruit from the trees belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. It's separated to him. So when we take something that's consecrated to him and we spend it on ourselves, we bring a curse on ourselves. Romans eleven sixteen says, Now if the first fruits offered up, New Testament, Apostle Paul, if the first fruits offered up are holy, so is the whole batch. What's that? The rest of it. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. So very clearly, Paul establishes the principle, continuing in the New Testament, he says, man, if you give God first, he'll make the rest of it holy too. He'll bless the rest of it. He'll bless it. Could this be why there's so many Christians that have trouble in their marriage? You say, well, what's your marriage like? Well, you know, it's a marriage. Well, I appreciate the fact that I'm married, this or that, but I mean, is God blessing your marriage? I wouldn't call it that. Why our kids aren't where they should be spiritually, or our grandkids? Could it simply be because we have not consecrated to God what belongs to Him and we've kept it for ourselves? And He has removed His blessing from our lives. Could it be that simple? Could it be that simple? I want to make it clear. God does not need us to give. But we need God's blessing. We need it. We need his blessing every day. There was a study done several years ago about giving among Christianity worldwide. And it was found out that giving worldwide by Christians was 1.8%. And so when, the, when it came back and those numbers came back, the people in America said, well, man, let's find out. Let's carve out America's giving from that because, and see what kind of a load, because America is the wealthiest nation in the, in the world, see what kind of a load we're carrying because the rest of the world is probably giving nothing and they found out that America was giving 1.7 that the rest of the free world, the rest of the world, Christianity, they were giving actually a higher percentage and rounding up America's numbers. 1.7 is the average giving from Christians in America. And we want our nation to be blessed. And we want our churches to be blessed. And we want God to bless us with souls. And has anybody in here with me wrestled over the fact that We just don't see people getting saved like we used to and the baptisms moving like they used to. And and are we just getting accustomed to hearing people say, well, they're getting divorced. Oh, they got laid off. Oh, the the health issues. Are we just getting accustomed to living a cursed life? Or do we want a blessed life? And now some of you are sitting here, you're going to walk away and say, Pastor Tom drank a prosperity gospel pill this week. And he's saying, name it, claim it. I am not saying that. I'm saying, put God first and let him bless us. Let him bless us. God doesn't need us to give. We need to be blessed. And we also need to pass this truth down. 
from generation to generation. The passage that we began in Exodus chapter 13, God explains to the children of Israel in the first Passover when he is reestablishing the law of the firstborn because they had walked away from it. They were in slavery 400 years because they, what? They weren't practicing these things. So he's reestablishing the principle with them. And as he's reestablishing this principle, he says in Exodus 13, verse 14 to 15, in the future when your son asks you, what does this mean? Dad, why are we taking the animal finally had a male? Why would you want to kill it? I mean, that's the future, man. Dad, why would you want to take the firstborn male of the cow and kill it? Man, that's the future. The milk's going to come from that. Why are you giving away the future? See? When your son asks, why don't we do this? You say to him, by the strength of God's hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt, out of the place of slavery. And when Pharaoh stubbornly refused to let us go, the Lord killed every firstborn male in the land of Egypt from the firstborn of man to the firstborn of livestock. That is why I sacrifice to the Lord all the firstborn of the womb that are all males, but I redeem all the firstborn of my sons. He said, tell your kids the story. Now, in Israel's story, it was a picture of slavery in Egypt, but we know that's a picture of our slavery to sin, to the grave, and to hell. Right. It's slavery that we cannot do anything about for ourselves, but God sent his firstborn Amen. to redeem us. And so when we're writing out those tithe checks, when we're giving God the first of our fruit, and your kids say, why do you give God for, You know what? If you didn't do that, just because I remember when Cindy and I were first married, I, I wanted to be a responsible man, and I sat down with a financial planner. And before the appointment, he said, bring all your stuff and, and every, you know, all, all your, and, you know, we were young married. We didn't have a whole lot of stuff. It all fit like in a manila folder. So I came in with all our stuff. It was just a few pieces of paper. And he said, okay, well, first of all, I want to kind of like interview you, find out where your money's going so that we can figure it out. And so we told him how much money we made, and she had moved from California here and hadn't found employment yet, so we were living on my salary. I was here, I was making $15,600, 300 bucks a week. Big money, right? Big money here at the church. And he said, okay, so what do you do? And so we showed him, here's, here's where the money goes, because I was, you know, I, I watched that stuff. I, I keep accurate records. And so he saw that out of that $15,600 the previous year, I said, well, 2,500 of it went to the church. He goes, there's your future right there. There's your future. I mean, he said it clear as a bell. He goes, there's your future. I said, what do you mean? He goes, that's your investment money. You're giving it to the church. You need to lower that down to about 2%. That's the national average. Lower it down 2%. Take the rest of that. Invest it for your future. I said, I am investing in it for my future. Right. Mm -hmm. Amen. You're not getting God's money. He said, well, you, you, that's the only way. I said, no, we're just going to have to lower our expenses other places because we're not giving you God's money. Amen. It belongs to him. Now, Cindy and I have done great in life. I make way more than 15600 praise God. Okay? I've beat cancer. She's beat a couple near-life and death things. We never thought we'd have children. We have two beautiful children. They have wonderful spouses. We are blessed. We are blessed people. Everything but the hair. Everything but the hair. But you know, those of you with hair, a lot of, a lot of it, you come to me after I say that, you say, it's not all that. You got to shampoo it, you got to quaff it, you got to do all that. So I bas basically, I'm blessed there too. It's a razor once a week and it's easy. Okay? We're blessed. Why? Because God is faithful to his word. 
He is. And I don't, want you, I don't want to use us as an example, but you know us. You know us. And every person in this church, as a pastor for 30 years that I talk to that is a tither, they will give you the testimony. We're blessed. We're blessed. I would not want to live any other way. Because why? Because my slavery to sin was broken by the clean one. The firstborn of God given to redeem me out of sin, out of slavery to hell. He set me free, and I'm going to keep what belongs to him for me? No. I'm going to give what belongs to him. Give him the honor. Give him the glory so that he can continue blessing our life. See, as we give first to the Lord, he then blesses, protects, and provides for us. And that's what, that's why I called this first thing first. May we begin 2017 by committing to him first. Not third, not, oh, I'm going to do better. Put him first. Put him first. There are some, you're sitting here today and you're like, man, I can't wait to get out of here. But you know what? You can hurry up and get out of here and go get what belongs to God and give it to him. And because today's still the first day of 2017. Let's get it started right. Do it today. Do it today. Why? Not because we need it. You need it. You need God's blessing. I need God's blessing. So let's put him first and see how much he blesses. Divine occurrences. That's why we're going to fast this month. That's why we're going to pray this month. We're going to ask God to bless us. And you know what? You're like, well, I think we should be more point. I don't even know what I need. But he does. He knows what I need. He knows tomorrow. He knows what's going to happen in June. He knows what's going to happen in October. So let's give him January and see if he doesn't redeem the rest. Let's give him the whole month. Let's get serious about it. Let's get crazy with it. And let's just take him at his word and see what he does. Amen? Amen. Amen. Heads bowed and eyes closed. If you're sitting here today and you're like, oh, this is refreshing. I know it's challenging. But God, right now, I can feel him doing a work in my heart and mind right now. And that's evidence that he's in my life, evidence that he's wanting to do a work in my life. And maybe you haven't felt or thought that in a long time. And right now, you're saying, okay, Lord, I'm going to put you to the test. I'm going to see. See if you can deliver on your promises. And maybe you have tested them in the past and it's just moved away, or maybe you're really faithful in that. But maybe you don't give God the first of your time, the first in your relationships, the first at work. Maybe you just, okay, you write the check so that God can get out of the rest. No, he wants to be first in all of it. In all of it. And maybe you need to just re rehearse that today and, and realign ourselves like God did with the Passover with Israel, realigning them with the truth of the firstborn. And give it back to God today. With heads bowed, eyes closed, if that's your prayer today, just lift up your hand and say, that's my prayer. Yes. I want, I want to consecrate and give to God what belongs to him so he can redeem the rest. Hands down, I want to ask one more question. Is there anybody here today when I talked about how that we are born unclean and God sent Jesus to purchase us back? If you've never allowed that to happen in your life, and today you want to ask him for forgiveness, right there where you're sitting, I just want you to pray with me. Dear Jesus, I believe that you were sent from God the Father 
to pay the price for my sin, to save me. Because that's true, I'm asking you to forgive me of my sins, to come in to my life and live within me. Make me a new person. Redeem me. Purchase me back by the life that you offered on the cross. Thank you for loving me so much, Jesus, and being such a wonderful Lord and Savior. If you prayed that prayer, we want to welcome you to the family. We are thrilled that you made that decision. Absolutely thrilled. Let's stand to our feet. We're going to sing together. And after we sing, I'm going to give people, as, as we're dismissed, an opportunity to come and pray. But right now, let's lift up our hearts because Jesus has redeemed us from the pit. Amen?